The potato famine I'm going to talk about started with the catastrophic failure of the potato crop in 1845 and over the following uh, decade was responsible for the death of over a million people and the emigration from the island of Ireland of a further two million plus. Famine wasn't uh, new in Ireland. There had been a very similar crop failure about a century earlier, and there'd been at least six smaller, more localized events in the 1800s, the most recent of which was only three years earlier in 1842. Many Irish nationalist historians and much of the Irish population uh, refer to this period as the Great Hunger. They don't refer to famine at all. Uh, as far as they're concerned, uh, grain exports carried on throughout the period. And certainly there are a number of people who believe that the amount of grain exported would have easily fed the, the people who were uh, devastated by the uh, potato failure. Most historians, however, uh, disagree. And the accepted belief is that the uh, nutritional value of the grain that was exported would fill more, no more than 15 percent of the requirements of the, the population. What's absolutely certain, however, is if the grain hadn't been exported, less people would have died. By way of comparison, the famine in Ethiopia that spawned the Live Aid concert in 1985 that we all remember, uh, almost certainly killed uh, less than half as many people. Uh, the estimates between three and 500,000 and it drove uh, less people out of Ethiopia as well. And the scale of it was that Ethiopia had a population of uh, almost 40 million. At this stage, the Irish population was about eight and a half. Like the Ethiopian famine, it's, it's a horror story. Uh, it, it has two parts. The first part was the random natural event that caused the crops to fail. The second part is the extraordinary failure of government to actually ensure that the uh, aid required was provided um, at the right time and in the right quantities to stop people dying. It's, it's the, the scale of the failure of government that leads many uh, Irish people and much of the Irish diaspora worldwide to believe that the government in Westminster conspired to cause uh, genocide. The story has a uh, widely accepted villain of the peace in the form of Sir Charles Trevelyan, who was the, the civil servant in charge of most of the operation of the treasury. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to go through isn't chronological. Uh, I cover the various aspects separately as I think that's easier to follow. It was certainly easier to to write it that way. Before the famine, uh, Ireland was a land of mainly absentee landlords. Uh, many of them uh, lived most of the year in, or some of them all of the year in, in England. Uh, their land was managed by agents and by middlemen, and their role in life was to extract the maximum profit from the land they were responsible for. Rent increases and uh, plot size reductions had been uh, common for the recent years. This reflected the, the growing uh, population. In 1800, the population of Ireland was 5 million. Uh, by 1845, it was well over 8 million. If you look at the, the slide, you'll see the mix of holdings at the, the start of the famine. 75% uh, of the farms by number, uh, as you'll see, were less than 20 acres. Uh, those over 20 acres were mainly on the better land and were farmed by largely profitable, larger tenant farmers. Uh, the small holdings were typically on the more marginal land, and this is where the uh, future famine victims lived. Uh, the small tenant farmers were called cottiers. Uh, their cash crop was mainly potatoes. And other land was also held by uh, 
bound laborers. These were people who were obliged to uh, do specific amounts of work uh, for the tenant farmer they, whose land they resided on. And they were allowed uh, a small uh, holding to grow potatoes and uh, provided with a cabin to live in. Uh, there was also some land held by unbound laborers. Uh, they were allowed to uh, rent uh, a plot of land under a system called Conacre, which meant that their, uh, their tenancy was less than a year. And they also grew potatoes and uh, built cabins on this land. Traditionally, there'd been some uh, home working uh, in the textile industry to supplement incomes. But uh, in the more recent years, this had been uh, mainly killed off by the growing number of textile factories that were springing up around Belfast and uh, on the on the Lagan Valley. The smallholders uh, lived mainly on the west and the, the southwest of the island. Uh, they grew potatoes and kept pigs. Uh, the potatoes fed the people and they also fed the pigs and the pigs provided manure and were said to pay the rent. Uh, the people didn't normally consume the pigs. The pigs were sold for cash to, to pay the landlords. Uh, unbound laborers uh, were quite mobile. They often left the country to work in England during the uh, what were known as the hunger months. These were the months between the uh, harvest being sown and being harvested. The model of land use uh, was recognized and had been for some time as unsustainable. Uh, the solution was seen that landlords would uh, get rid of the small holdings, uh, employ the ex small holders as, as wage laborers and uh, run much bigger and more effective farms. Um, the Irish population was seen, especially from England and especially in publications like Punch and The Times, as uh, lazy and dishonest. Uh, cartoons often showed them uh, as a small simian uh, monkey type creatures. It's what we would uh, accept as institutional racism. When the famine arrived, it was actually seen by some of the landlords as a golden opportunity to speed up the process of, of land reform in Ireland. The famine victims generally lived in the bottom two classes of dwellings as classified by the uh, Irish uh, government at that stage. Uh, the lowest uh, class was the uh, cabin that was built entirely of turf uh, with no windows and only one room. Uh, the class three cabin, the, the next to the worst, was also built from turf or stones if there were stones available. Uh, that had typically two rooms and had a window. By 1845, uh, it said that uh, more than 50% of the population had a potato heavy diet. and uh, three and a third million of these ate almost nothing but potatoes. Uh, those who lived near the coast uh, sometimes had some fish and all uh, people who ate potatoes normally ate them with a bit of buttermilk uh, and drank milk. Uh, the, the average Irish agricultural worker at this stage ate between 10 and 14 pounds of potatoes each and every day. Despite this, they were on average healthier and taller than their English counterparts. The type of potato they grew uh, was the Irish lumper. Uh, this had become the dominant strain. It, it was widely accepted that it didn't taste as good as uh, most of the others uh, and it didn't keep as well as some of the others, uh, but it actually produced uh, far more uh, potatoes uh, per acre than, than anything else. By 1845, uh, there were almost no potatoes other than lumpers uh, grown in, in Ireland. The blight arrived in September 1845. 
there was some dispute about the origins. There were some suggestions it came on uh, boats carrying guano from Peru, uh, but it's now been identified. Uh, I can't pronounce the word. Uh, uh, as heard one version of the uh, blight that actually struck in the United States in uh, 1843 and 1845. Uh, the blight spread uh, from, uh, from the United States uh, and it reached Ireland after it had hit Belgium, Holland, northern France and southern England. It struck immediately after the best oat, best oat crop for years uh, had been harvested and in a period of 10 weeks, the potato crop was totally devastated. Uh, this wreaked havoc. Uh, in November, the government mansion house committee suggested a third of the crop had been lost. Uh, by December, they'd revised this to 50 percent. And the market authorities in Dublin said that regardless of any action that might be taken, there would be no potatoes for sale at the end of January. You'll see from the slides on here the uh, the scale of the, the crop failure. Uh, in 1846, the blight uh, started earlier and struck harder than in 1845. If you look at the millions of uh, acres planted with potatoes, you'll see there was a decline between uh, 1845 and 1847 from two and a half million to half a million. And the production itself went down from 15 million to just over 2 million. In 1847, you'll see from the bottom slide that the actual yield per acre uh, went up and recovered to before the 1845 level. Uh, unfortunately, uh, by this stage, uh, there were no seed potatoes to be had. And although those who managed to plant some got a very good yield, uh, there weren't very many people who could actually plant them. As far as uh, preservation of the potatoes that actually were picked was concerned, uh, Sir Robert Peel um, uh, set up an expert committee. Uh, it was useless. Its original suggestion for the cause of the blight uh, was weather. Uh, they said it was a one-off caused by the weather and uh, they could easily uh, see uh, seed potatoes being imported from Europe and everything being fine. They'd obviously not read that Europe had been struck by the blight before Ireland. Uh, they then produced a, a storage guide with a very complicated uh, set of instructions on how people should store potatoes to keep them absolutely dry. Uh, they produced 30,000 copies of these instructions, uh, which they distributed through all the local parish priests so they could be onward distributed. Uh, but about a week later, they actually uh, changed their instructions to uh, soak the potatoes in bog water because uh, that will help to preserve them. Uh, an influential journal uh, at the time called Freeman's Journal uh, concluded that the committee have satisfactorily pr proved that they know nothing whatsoever about the causes of or the cure for the disease. Dublin Castle, the uh, home of the Irish administration, uh, failed to grasp the danger. Uh, they first assumed uh, that the reports uh, were exaggerated, uh, then that the oat harvest that had been gathered in a few weeks before would, would fill the gap, despite the fact that this was uh, already in many cases on ships out of the country. And then that the, the market would react to shortages and uh, ensure that food was imported. Um, what they failed to realize as well was that the people who were actually now uh, short of food uh, were not people who had cash. They were people who grew their own food. They didn't buy it. Uh, and they would need some sort of paid employment to be able to survive. Uh, Sir Robert Peel had been more aware of the situation than the most people. Uh, he'd uh, preemptively bought £100,000 worth of maize from the United States and £46,000 worth of oats from the market. And he expected to be able to feed uh, about 440,000 people for three months. Uh, 
he was uh, asked to provide a loan of a million pounds in October. And the Mansion House Committee uh, increased this request to one and a half million uh, in November on the 7th. Uh, to increase the availability and reduce the cost of food and to provide work for the destitute. They also uh, asked that grain exports be stopped. Uh, it didn't happen. And by December, the potato price had gone up more than double and the price of grain had gone up by 50%. The government then set up uh, 650 relief committees between November 1845 and August 1846. Uh, these were to be funded by the landlords. This was uh, part of Trevelyan's uh, plan, which basically said Irish property pays for Irish poverty. That became his mantra, and you'll hear it more than once. Uh, a series of grain depots were also established with the intention of distributing imported grain in the hunger months. Uh, two work programs were established to provide the destitute with an income. Uh, one scheme was to be managed by the counties, which was more localised initiatives. The second one by the Board of Works. Uh, both were to be financed by loans, uh, some of which were uh, expected to be paid in full. Uh, some of which were uh, potentially to be written off. Initially, the plan was to do genuinely beneficial things, uh, improve drainage schemes, build new harbours and a network of good roads. There was also a plan to uh, establish some railways, but this bit of the plan was abandoned because it was deemed that the Irish weren't capable of building railways. 30 years later, they built the eastern half of the transcontinental railway in America. The organization of the program was shambolic. Uh, the management couldn't cope with the rapid growth of the workforce, which went from 20,000 in June uh, 46 to 140,000 in August. The work wasn't properly directed. Uh, they did little but road repairs and construction as far as roads were concerned was restricted to what became known as famine roads, which were uh, short roads that went from nowhere to nowhere and were basically uh, usually uh, on level ground. The response the uh, following year uh, was after uh, Sir Robert Peel had been replaced by Lord John Russell. Uh, Russell assumed the potato problem was basically over. Uh, only one work programme was, uh, was planned. Uh, this was to be operated by the Board of Works and the loans that were to fund it were to be 100% repaid. Again, uh, following uh, Trevelyan's mantra that the people in Ireland must pay for Irish poverty. The organisation of this scheme uh, went from from bad to unbelievable. The pay was to be uh, by measured work so that people would get paid on piecework for, for what they, do, they did. Uh, the expectation was a, 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 an average man would earn a shilling a day. Somebody who really worked very hard would earn one or six a day. And where there was work that couldn't really be measured, um, that would be paid at the rate of uh, eight pence a day. The start of the scheme was delayed to October 1846. Uh, 12,000 administration staff were employed to uh, look after the thing, uh, but nothing like enough overseers and engineers to actually set and measure the work were employed. Another complication was that all new projects had to be presented to and approved by the Viceroy. At the start of this uh, work scheme, there were 26,000 people employed. In March 47, that number had increased to 714,000 that were organised into more than 10,000 work gangs uh, spread across the, the areas uh, struck by hunger. Uh, 
There's one instance of a, of a work gang in Kong in County Mayo uh, that's recorded as having 75 men. The only equipment they had were two wheelbarrows, two crowbars, and one uh, wooden lever. These men were unable to earn more than three pence a day. There was a, a, a belief that uh, if work was to was work measurement was delayed, uh, people would be paid nine pence a day on on account. However, the payment was often late, uh, often weeks late, and the Board of Works were on more than one occasion found guilty of gross neg negligence manslaughter uh, when workers starved to death. Uh, because they hadn't received their wages. The Quakers had already started to open soup kitchens. Uh, the government decided to follow suit in early 1847 uh, in face of the increasing levels of starvation. The, uh, the Quakers initiative had been helped by the uh, famous uh, Darby's, uh, the Quaker family who were the iron masters in Colebrookdale, who uh, donated 50 soup boilers. The Quakers were eventually have uh, a total of 300 soup kitchens. The way these were financed was that uh, they sold soup tickets at half a penny each, and they endeavoured to sell these to the well off so that the Tickets could be then used by the destitute to get food for, for free. Uh, Trevelyan was attracted to the idea as it promised to be cheaper than the work schemes. The work schemes were uh, scheduled to be shut down uh, in May, but at that point only 1,350 of the 2,000 electric, electoral districts uh, were able to set up uh, soup kitchens and food distribution. Again, this was uh, an opportunity for yet more bureaucracy. Uh, before the thing could get underway, uh, 10,000 account books needed to be designed and printed, 80,000 record sheets, and 3 million uh, ration tickets to be distributed through the, the network. The rules of operation were also not consistent. The kitchens were often miles apart. And some of them insisted that all family members had to present themselves to uh, to get fed. Uh, this was obviously a problem for the for the very sick and the very hungry. Some uh, allowed one person to collect the food, but again, because of the distances con uh, concerned, it was often the case that the food was actually completely useless by the time it got back to the the people who needed it. Some uh, sites offered uncooked food for preparation by the, the starving at home. Uh, this was much more pop popular uh, and significantly more expensive, which was in due course to come to Trevelyan's notice. And he then said that where a facility could offer hot food, only hot food was to be supplied. Uh, if you could do hot soup, you didn't supply ingredients. Despite this uh, 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 organization being uh, arranged, it's estimated that at least 15% of the people who were actually destitute uh, in need of hunger were uh, deemed to be uh, entitled to the, uh, to, the, to the food being distributed. As one uh, sort of variant on this, the Protestant church uh, actually launched a missionary campaign in some of the areas in the far west. Uh, this was uh, effectively started by them building schools, uh, good schools with good teachers, uh, open to children of, of all, rage, uh, all races and creeds. Uh, but they then started to offer soup to both the children and to adults. Uh, the stipulation, however, with the adults was that they had to convert to Protestantism to be allowed to get access to the soup. Uh, 
these people were in due course uh, said to be people who had converted to superism rather than Protestantism. In addition to uh, government and landlord funded relief, there were also uh, some charitable uh, donations. Uh, the Quakers uh, calculated that about one and a half million pounds was was raised. Uh, they themselves raised about 200,000. But inevitably, over time, uh, charity uh, fatigue set in. When the, the original uh, official charity commission was set up, uh, it contained no, uh, no Catholics at all uh, among its board members. The Queen uh, spearheaded uh, or figureheaded uh, two separate appeals. Uh, the first one brought in £171,000. Uh, she was apparently responsible for donating £2,000. Uh, the Prime Minister donated £200 and Trevelyan contributed £25. There is an unverified uh, report or several unverified reports that suggest the ruler of Turkey uh, donated £10,000 but had £8,500 of it returned with the message that nobody could be seen to be more generous than the Queen. The Queen's second appeal in 1847, when conditions were at the most dire, raised only £30,000. And by 1848-49, the Quakers had actually uh, changed their modus operandi in Ireland to uh, addressing the causes of the famine and trying to make sure there wasn't one again in the future. Uh, they set up model farms uh, to show the farmers how to farm more effectively. Uh, they campaigned for land reform and they distributed uh, a wide range of different vegetable seeds to the surviving smallholders to increase the uh, odds that they would survive. 130 workhouse unions had been established in Ireland in the 1830s. Uh, these had originally been designed to accommodate uh, just over 100,000 uh, destitute people. The 1847 uh, Poor Law Amendment made the Irish Poor Law Guardians responsible for all relief to the destitute. And it was presumed that all the uh, work and food programs would then close. This work was to be supported by uh, a poor rate. This was to be levied at 100% on landlords' holdings where a tenant was paying less than £4 a year for rent, uh, and 100% where the tenant paid more than £5 a year, more than £4 a year for rent. The workhouse conditions were to be made hard enough to deter all but the most desperate. Uh, they were to be segregated and it was to be hard labour uh, to ensure that the people inside were fed. There was also a provision to provide outdoor relief, which had not been uh, allowed previously. Uh, the previous rules were the only sick, very old, and widows with at least two legitimate children were allowed relief outside the workhouse. But this was now modified to uh, able-bodied people could be given relief, uh, but only if the workhouse was full or it had been closed by disease. Our Irish property, in the form of the landlords and MPs who sat in the Houses of Lords and the Houses of Commons, uh, were very, very, very upset about this. Uh, the cost they saw was going to be crippling. And they had a thing called the Greg Gregory Rule included in the Poor Law Amendment Bill. This actually stated that no one who uh, occupied more than a quarter of an acre of land could be, de could be uh, considered to be destitute. If the husband in a family decided to stay on his piece of land and send his wife and children to the workhouse, he could be jailed for uh, causing them to become uh, destitute under the Vagrancy Act. Uh, 
And this clause uh, was one of the things that proved to be uh, deadly to the uh, small holding population. The government assumed that Irish landlords would use loans that they were offering to them at uh, advantageous uh, rates of interest to improve their estates, uh, creating jobs and reducing the burden of them on them of poor rates. However, most of the landlords were already uh, very highly indebted and were unhappy to take on any more, more debt. Uh, the net effect was that uh, the destitute didn't get work. This led to disaster. The Fermoy workhouse that was designed for 800 people uh, and didn't have a fever hospital uh, in March 1847 contained 1800 people. And between January and March 1847, 24% of the people who were admitted were dead by the end of March. The Skibbereen workhouse was designed for 800. By December 1848, that contained 2,800 people. If you look at the weekly workhouse death rate, that is a weekly rate. It was running in October 1846 at four per thousand residents. In April 1847, it was running at 25 per thousand residents. Extra capacity was built, uh, but demand outstripped it. Uh, many Gregory tenants resisted entry to preserve their scrap, scrap of land and only abandoned their small holdings uh, to go to the workhouse to get a Christian burial. It's reported that the coffins that were used to bury people, uh, to take people from Skibbereen workhouse to the graveyard, actually had hinged bottoms. So although they thought they were getting a decent burial, they were actually just taken and dumped in pits. As the death rate increased, uh, they started to reopen uh, soup kitchens and to uh, some and some work work uh, schemes but it was too little too late by the end of june 1848 there were 843,000 people on relief the cost of the poor rate ruined uh, many landlords an extreme example was the Clifton Workhouse Union. They charged a poor rate of 24 and fourpence in the pound. So in that instance, a landlord who had a tenant with an agreement where he paid four pounds a year rent was charged five pounds a year poor rate. Some of the unions also became bankrupt. Uh, and the government officials that were uh, replaced the workhouse guardians uh, actually uh, caused yet more problems for the landlords. In some instances, the guardians were in fact landlords themselves, and where they fell into arrears, they weren't particularly uh, diligent in pursuing the uh, collection of these arrears. Uh, the officials were actually relentless, and the uh, uh, amount of landlord bankruptcies uh, grew dramatically. Faced with uh, rising rate charges and tenants unable to pay their rent, uh, and without these tenants having any livestock or seed to seize in lieu, many landlords decided that they really had to evict the tenants. Once they'd made the decision, uh, the legal process favoured eviction in bulk. Uh, they could appeal to a higher court uh, and effectively get a ruling for uh, a large number of, of properties at one time. If the tenants didn't immediately enter a defence when the order was served, the landlord could apply for, per permission, uh, for possession and he could immediately turn them out onto the road. Uh, once they were evicted, uh, the Roof was typically taken off the property and it was made immediately uninhabitable. 
This was because if uh, a tenant was able to reoccupy it, uh, the landlord would need to get an individual order that could be almost as expensive as uh, as evicting 50 people. Uh, the police were often uh, asked to attend to make sure things went smoothly. Uh, there were questions in Parliament about the scale and consequences for the evicted. Uh, the Home Secretary, uh, when he was challenged, uh, replied uh, that uh, these people are, of course, like all of the citizens, able to seek remedy through the court, which was not a lot of good to uh, a, a cottier who'd just been thrown out onto the street. Lord John Russell uh, was frustrated. He tried to have the operation of the poor law amended, uh, but the uh, he couldn't get uh, majorities for what he wanted to do. The only changes he managed to get were that poor law guardians had to be given 48 hours notice of planned evictions. Uh, there were to be no evictions on Christmas Day or Good Friday, and that all evictions were to be done in daylight. Uh, there are some notorious evictors. One of the largest was a certain Lord Lucan. Another one uh, was a gentleman called uh, Colonel Dennis Mahone. Uh, he uh, evicted 4,000 people. Uh, 1,400 of, of them he, he emigrated to Canada. Uh, the 1,400 he emigrated were mainly the second week and a large proportion of them didn't survive. Uh, he, uh, in due course, was murdered, and the British press uh, agitated for the indictment of the local parish priest for incitement to murder because he'd preached against uh, evictions. The cost of evicting people, uh, of emigrating people to uh, the New World, uh, was seen by some landlords as, as uh, attractive. Uh, one recorded he'd emigrated uh, 1,400 people for three shillings of four, 14, three pounds, 14 shillings a head. Another 4,000 at three pounds, 10 shillings a head. Um, this uh, obviously had a, an upfront cost, but over time, uh, they actually saw it as being uh, cheaper than uh, paying the poor rates. The expectation, as seen in this uh, extract from the Times, was that the the poor, uh, useless landlords would be um, driven off the land, uh, the estates would be sold, uh, and uh, they'd be bought by uh, industrious Scots and English and uh, Ireland would be turned into a, 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 a much better uh, organised agricultural country. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Most of the uh, estates were actually bought by other Irish landlords. The result of the total mismanagement of the famine was, was mass, de mass death. Uh, as you can see from the graphs, most people didn't die from starvation. But hunger was the, the root cause of almost all the deaths. It put the destitute onto the roads, into the workhouses, fever hospitals, jails, insanitary rooming houses, all of which provided ideal conditions for the spread of disease. The main killer was fever. Uh, there were two main types, uh, typhus and relapsing fever, both of which were spread by lice, uh, both of which uh, were uh, to find ideal hosts in the ragged, unwashed people uh, that the famine produced. The fact that typhus was, was endemic among the poor and many of them had resistance to it uh, actually had consequences for uh, some of the charity workers that, that tried to help them. Uh, they, the, the people who showed no symptoms at all um, spread it to the soup kitchen volunteers and religious helpers trying to keep them alive. Uh, they also spread it uh, well beyond the borders of Ireland uh, when they went to uh, other countries. Uh, the figures for deaths are unreliable. There are instances of whole families dying in ditches, 
which nobody took the trouble to report to the official bodies. The Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin, which was known for his exemplary record keeping before and after the famine, uh, during the famine years uh, has hundreds of people, uh, unidentified people, uh, buried in mass graves. Uh, a million deaths is the widely accepted uh, number. One respected contemporary statistician suggested it might be closer to two million. Um, and another element of the uh, effect on the population was it suggested that uh, 400,000 children uh, weren't born in, in this period. The, death rate, uh, the birth rate dropped by about 400,000. The appalling conditions in Ireland uh, drove uh, significant emigration. There had been emigration for many years from, from Ireland uh, prior to the famine. Uh, these were mainly young, uh, ambitious, single people with skills. And they went to seek their fortune in the new world. Uh, many of them were then able to send money home and provide tickets for families to, to join them. Uh, and when the famine struck, some of the good tenant farmers who, who knew about the success some of these immigrants had, saw the writing on the wall and left very early on. However, most of the emigrants were, were very different in 1845 to 55. These were desperate people. Uh, over two million left, some of them by their own uh, choice, some were coerced. Almost all of them, however they decided to go, had sold everything they owned to raise the fare. Uh, some were able to raise the fare only from Cork to Bristol or Dublin to Liverpool, others to get passage to uh, America or to Canada. Uh, they almost all went, uh, the transatlantic ones via Liverpool, and this uh, uh, assembly of sculptures on the screen is called Famine. And it's on Custom House Quay on the north bank of the Liffey in Dublin. And it's on the route from the centre of Dublin to uh, Dublin North Wall Quay, which is where the uh, uh, ferry boats to Ireland left. There was a huge increase uh, of Irish population in the, the northwest as a result of the famine. There'd been uh, significant uh, immigration before, mainly through Liverpool. Uh, in 1844, Frederick Engels had written The Condition of the Working Class in England in which he described uh, Little Ireland and Irish Town, which were slum areas of Manchester where large numbers of the Irish uh, emigrants, the earlier Irish emigrants, uh, worked in the mills and construction and typically were living in, in dire conditions which were common to most of the working population of uh, you know, Manchester and, and the industrial areas at that time. The scale was extraordinary. Uh, 50,000 emigrants arrived in Liverpool in March 1847 alone. Many of them were sick when they boarded the ships. Uh, the conditions on board the ships were appalling. Uh, one voyage in 40, 1848 is recorded as uh, being struck by very bad weather, which led to a, a, a very long crossing indeed. And at the end of it, of the 150 series passengers who'd got on in, in Ireland, uh, 72 of them were dead when they got to Liverpool. Liverpool was the first city to appoint uh, a medical officer of health, uh, a Dr. William Duncan. Uh, he was appointed in 1846 and he, uh, in 1851, described the city as a city of plague. In 1847, it was estimated 60,000 people had typhus and 40,000 had dysentery. In subsequent years, waves of flu, scarlet fever, cholera and diarrhoea also took their toll. It, uh, at this time, Ireland was described as Ireland's, Liverpool was described as Ireland's hospital and cemetery. 
The immigrants were described as living in dog kennels and basements, and huge numbers of them lived in uh, terribly overcrowded, multi-occupancy uh, buildings that were known as courts. You may have seen illustrations of these. These were effectively U-shaped uh, terraces of back-to-back -back houses with one uh, water tap and one drain at one end of the uh, of the court. The 1841 census listed 106,000 Irish born living in Lancashire. This is people who had actually but were born in Ireland and had moved. The 1851 census, census 10 years later had 191,000 uh, and the Irish born made up about 10% of the population at that stage. Uh, the percentage of Liverpool uh, Irish born went from 17% to 22%. The main centres of Irish population in the northwest were Liverpool, Manchester, Salford, Preston, Oldham, St Helens and Widnes. And between them, these seven towns uh, accounted for more than 65% of the total. But the Irish spread through all major industrial towns. The main occupations that they went into were uh, industrial and construction labouring and mining uh, for men. And for single women, uh, they went into domestic service. In the famine years, uh, lots of families moved. Before and after those, it was predominantly uh, single people. The influx uh, had an adverse effect on the poor rate burden of the Northwest. Uh, the uh, destitute Irish were now uh, living in workhouses, being supported by uh, English taxpayers. And the uh, Authorities in Liverpool managed to send 15% uh, of uh, 15,000 people back to Ireland, but in the grand scheme of things, this was uh, a, a drop in the ocean. Over the years, the Irish settled, uh, but they retained, understandably, some animosity towards the uh, the British state institutions. Uh, they integrated with the local population, but stand, but tended to stay in in Irish areas. Uh, Irish cultural centres developed in Liverpool. Uh, the Irish World Heritage Centre is in, in Manchester. And in Ashton, in Makerfield, where I live, uh, the Brian Baru has offered Irish music, Irish dancing lessons, and a place to go for the Irish since 1887, 1889. Uh, three of my grandparents were emigr uh, emigrants from, from Ireland. They were after the famine. Uh, they were eco economic migrants. Uh, my parents and my uncles and aunties uh, spent their nights out at the Brian Baru Club when I was growing up. And some of my cousins spent evenings there planning expeditions to go back to Ireland and find relatives who'd uh, stayed in the old country that we'd lost contact with. The destination of choice for the emigrants was the United States. Uh, but passage there was more than twice as expensive as going to Canada, which meant that uh, lots of people went to Canada uh, intending to travel south later on. Uh, ships to the US were generally regulated and safe, whereas uh, many of the cheap Canadian passages offered were our return journeys on what became known as coffin ships. Uh, these ships had brought timber, uh, to Liverpool. Uh, they weren't designed for transporting passengers. They were actually in a very bad state of repair, but it was commented that they were never knowingly underinsured. Uh, some landlord evicted voyages were on these ships, and on those instances, they went direct from small, unregulated ports on Ireland's west coast. Uh, this is an account of a passage. Uh, from a letter sent to the Colonial Office by Stephen de Vere. He was a Limerick landlord and philanthropist and a social reformer. He sailed on a coffin ship in early 1847. And that's, this is what he wrote. <clears throat> 
He concluded his letter by confirming that the ship that he was he took passage on, he was assured was by no means the worst of the uh, the ships making the the journey. The first season, 1847, was appalling. Uh, it got better in the following years. The Irish National Famine Memorial is a famine ship which is at uh, Westport in County Mayo. And if you look in detail at it, you'll see that lots of the uh, bits of the ship are represented by skeletal remains. Most immigrants to Canada uh, went to Quebec by way of the quarantine station at Gros Isle on the St. Lawrence River. Although this has expanded to cope with 2,000 sick on arrival, uh, 300 recovering, and 3,500 uh, people who were well and awaiting release into, uh, into the country, it was swamped. In May 1847, there was a two mile queue of 40 ships containing 13,000 people under quarantine. A week later, this had grown to 21,000. Even when the ice came and closed the river in, 1840, uh, in late 1847, there were still 14,000 people in the queue. Deaths ran at the rate of about 50 a day from almost as soon as the first ship landed. The worst day uh, was June the 5th, when 150 people were, were buried. The other main reception area was called uh, Port St. Charles, which is near Montreal, and the rates of mortality there were, were similar. Uh, there are mass graves at both sites, and uh, each is said to contain more than 6,000 people. It's estimated that 30% of the people who left for Canada in 1847 either died en route or very shortly after arrival. The typhus epidemic that they brought with them killed another 20,000 Canadians in 1847. Uh, that was sailors, doctors, uh, religious uh, helpers and quarantine station employees. Uh, the memorial on Gros Seal, which is a bigger picture of, uh, has a detailed inscription that makes it clear that uh, the, the population of, uh, of North America believed there was uh, a, a villain in this. Between 1845 and 1855, uh, of the over two million who left Ireland, uh, one and a half million went to the United States. That was uh, far more uh, than went to Canada, which was uh, estimated at about 400,000, and the 200,000 who stayed in England. Despite the uh, send me your poor, your huddle masses, etc. Uh, inscription on the Statue of Liberty, uh, the US authorities weren't remarkably welcoming to all Irish. Um, any ships that were deemed to have uh, high levels of disease uh, were turned away. Uh, the captains there typically went uh, just north of the border uh, and then disembarked the passengers in the first harbour they could find in Canada. Uh, New York in uh, imposed a surcharge of $10 per passenger to offset the potential cost of supporting the, the sick and, in, uh, and, and dying. Boston charged uh, sick and infirm people up to $1,200 before they were allowed off the ships. To some extent, the uh, landlord evicted uh, emigrants were, were better off. Uh, they actually came as a group who typically uh, had been, if not friends, uh, neighbours, and they tended to, uh, to carry on living with those people when they first settled. When they first settled, uh, the settling in help that was promised by the landlords uh, usually didn't appear, and everybody ended up in, in slums. 
there is one record of a multi-story barracks type slum in New York uh, in a, a place called Five Points, which was a, uh, a notorious uh, slum area. Uh, this building had 400 residents. It had only one staircase and that staircase was 20 inches wide. Uh, the Irish uh, were not welcomed at all by many Americans. The old uh, original uh, American settlers and descendants thereof were all uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who'd fled from persecution in Catholic Europe and weren't overly keen on large numbers of Catholics uh, coming in. Uh, there was an organization called the Know Nothings. This was an organization that apparently was very similar to the Ku Klux Klan. But instead of uh, picking on Negroes, it picked on Irish. There was also the inevitable pushback from the uh, the workers in in America, who uh, accused the uh, Irish of uh, undercutting them and trying to steal their jobs. However, over time, uh, they gravitated to. Uh, Irish towns and Irish areas in, in places like New York and Boston. Uh, they developed strong communities and strong, powerful families grew up like the Kennedys and others who uh, came uh, to have some influence on world affairs, uh, typically with some, uh, some grievances against the English. The, the consequences for the, for the British in Ireland was that the uh, younger members of the Daniel O'Connell led uh, nonviolent uh, active union repeal movement uh, who wanted independence for Ireland uh, but did it with a nonviolent uh, uh, protest. Uh, the younger members broke away uh, and formed an organization called Young Ireland. Uh, this movement mounted rebellion in 1848 that was defeated. Uh, the leaders were captured, uh, or some of the leaders were captured, arrested, convicted uh, of treason, and sentenced to death. Uh, they didn't appeal. On principle, they didn't appeal, uh, as they didn't recognize the British just jurisdiction. Nevertheless, they were re re reprieved and they were transported. Um, they escaped from their exile and joined the leaders of the rebellion who'd uh, avoided capture and uh, fled to America. They, they then founded the Fenian societies that prospered in the 1850s, which promoted and funded uh, militant Irish nationalists uh, committed to what was known until very recently is the armed struggle. This persisted for many, many years as an organization called NORAID, which uh, helped to openly bankroll the IRA until it was declared illegal. Whether it still carries on or not is, is open to debate. And now Irish Republican groups continue to cite the behavior of the West Westminster government during the famine as justification for a united Ireland. The consequences for, uh, for Britain uh, outside Ireland are basically enduring reputational damage. Historians have calculated that the total cost of the British Treasury of the Irish famine was £7 million. Uh, this included the food purchases, written off loans, and all of the support. By way of comparison, the army's annual budget was 16 million pounds. 12 years earlier in 1833, the government had authorized compensation payments totaling 20 million pounds to the owners of West Indian slaves. And in the 1853-56 Crimean War, uh, the government spent £69 million. Pounds. A. J. P. Taylor, who was the historian, the only historian to, to listen to when I was growing up, described the actions of the British government as genocide. 
Another critic, although not using the word genocide, wrote, as on the screen, Tony Blair, during the commemoration of 150 years since the famine, said, the famine was a defining event in the history of Ireland and Britain. One million people died in what was then the richest and most powerful nation in the world. Those who governed in London at the time failed their people. That's the end of the, the story about the famine. One, one sort of aside is that the lump of potato uh, understandably fell out of favour after the famine. Uh, it, it, however, wasn't completely abandoned uh, and is still offered by Glen's Potatoes of Antrim as part of their heritage range. Apparently, you can buy them in Marks and Spencer's branches in, in Ireland. The books that I got the information from this on are The Great Irish Potato Famine by James S. Donnelly, Jr., uh, the Famine Plot by Tim Pat Coogan and The Irish Famine uh, by a gentleman called Peter Gray. Uh, I did the original presentation in uh, 2017, but I withdrew these three books from the uh, Wigan Library to reread again before I, I did it for you. Uh, they've all gone back if you'd like to uh, to borrow them.